What do we think the Titans top 10 big board looks like for the 2024 NFL draft? Well, we're going to build one. We're going to build our own version of what we think is the Titans top 10 big board, mostly probably for pick number seven or if they trade back from there. But another way of looking at this, who are the 10 most likely players the Titans will pick in the first round? That is what we're trying to find out today. This is the Music City Audible. Let's get to it. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast presented by Broadway Sports Media in partnership with 440 Sports. I'm Justin Graver and with me as always, Justin Mello. And today, Justin, like I said, we're building out a top 10 big board for the Titans. How are you doing? Doing well, excited to do this for you. You know, pick you at number seven. They've got to be prepared for a bunch of scenarios and all options. And I think this is a good way to do it, to build out a top 10 big board. I agree. And, and kind of look at, like I said, the top 10 most likely pick. I think the last two or three years on this podcast, we've done a 10 most likely picks for the Titans in the first round. This is our way of doing that this year. We're doing it a little different. We're building a big board. But before we get into that, let me tell you about Sinker's Beverages in East Nashville and Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville, our sponsors for this episode. Check them out. They have a huge selection of booze, wine, bourbon, everything you could dream of that you need to throw. Maybe a huge draft party coming up. So head over to Sinker's Beverages in East Nashville or Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville and stock up. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the channel, give us a thumbs up, and drop a comment below. What does your top 10 big board look like for the Titans? Let us know in the comments below. Who do you think should be the pick at number seven or in the first round under a tradeback scenario? All right, Justin, let's get into it here. The top of our big board, I think this is a player that is not very likely to be the Titans' first round pick just because he's not very likely, in fact, I would say 0.1% chance that he makes it to pick number seven, but he's got to be the top of their board. Marvin Harrison Jr., wide receiver out of Ohio State. We're in full agreement here. I mean, the chance is luck. Arizona at four, Chargers at five. Uh, everyone, actually, I think Giants at six. Uh, who's at seven? No, sorry, the Titans, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> uh, like, who would not take this guy? on that list, right? Like, come on, the, the Cardinals, I have a hard time thinking the Cardinals, the Chargers, and the Giants all pass on him. They all have needs, huge needs at receivers. Who's wide receiver one in Arizona right now? Like, they got rid of Hollywood Brown. It's a really, really bad list. Michael you look at the, Wilson? <laughs> Michael Wilson, exactly. I mean, you look at the Chargers, almost as bad, right, without Keenan Allen and Mike Williams, and, he, and the Giants at six. Like, all three of these teams just so happen, bad luck for the Titans. They need receivers so bad. I don't see any way this guy gets past those teams. And if he does, Titans should sprint the pick to the podium. He is the best overall prospect in the class. That has never changed for me. It's been true since the season started, essentially, or he did not disappoint. He is almost a perfect wide receiver prospect, and uh, he should be number one on the. You got to be prepared for all scenarios. Like, we're not going to talk about them, and we didn't include him on this list, but Caleb Williams might be the number one player on their board. You know what I mean? Like, these things happen, right? Like, you're prepared for everything, but in our board, you know, we're ignoring the quarterbacks like we should. Those guys, you know, Caleb Williams not making it to seven, so it doesn't matter. But from a team perspective, they got to literally be prepared for all scenarios. For us, that includes Marvin Harrison Jr., number one player on our big board. And quickly, before we move on to our second player, I will play out the scenario that sees Marvin Harrison fall to the Titans. So we are Please. getting reports now. There are there are There are numerous reports. Now, whether or not you want to believe these is up to you that teams have Malik neighbors ranked higher on their board than Marvin Harrison Jr. So here's the scenario. The first four picks are all quarterbacks. Some or first, five, Four out of the first five picks are all quarterbacks. Trade-ups, trade-downs, whatever has to happen. Giants maybe move up to four instead of the Vikings or the whoever, the Raiders, the Broncos. Somebody comes up into the top five, takes a quarterback. So four of the first five picks are quarterbacks. Chargers maybe stick and pick and take uh, a tackle. Joe Alt there. There's been a lot of talk out of Chargers camp about the importance of O-line and blah, 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 blah. And a lot of Char Chargers fans think they're definitely going receiver. You talked about their receiving options. They definitely need one. They take a tackle. And then the Giants have neighbors ranked ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr. on their big board. Bang, he's there at pick seven. I think that is an extremely unlikely scenario. I certainly would not bet money on that scenario to play out. But I, there is at least the possibility that the draft falls that way. That's not impossible, like you said. I think you've got to get the four quarterbacks in the top six. That's key. And then you got to get a team that has neighbors ahead of them and then a team that wants alignment. So stranger things have happened. I'll give you that. But I think ultimately you and I would both be surprised if this guy was on the board at number seven. 
surprised, but excited. All right, number two. Very excited. <laughs> <laughs> number two on the big board here that we're building for the Titans, the most likely pick for them at number seven, offensive tackle Joe Alt at a Notre Dame. The biggest hangup here is will he make it? I just mentioned the Chargers and the offensive line talk that's been going on. They very well could take Joe Alt at number five. But if the Chargers trade down or if they go with the wide receiver that they desperately need for their offense and for Justin Herbert, I think there's no, I don't think the Giants are taking Joe Alt. I don't think he's going top four. I think he is very likely to be on the board when the Titans pick at seven. And if he is, I think they sprint that pick to the podium. I agree. And uh, not everyone's probably going to agree with us having him at number two. I've seen people have him at one. I bet there are people that have him at three or four uh, behind the next guy on our list that we'll get to in a second. But uh, plug and play left tackle. They need to start her so bad at that position. You talk about the upside, especially with Bill Callahan as the O-line coach. Uh, number two for us, but I would, would rank number one on a uh, most realistic top 10 big board. Exactly. And I think if you want to know more about Joe Alt, we've talked extensively about him as a prospect. We did a 40 minute film breakdown a couple weeks ago. So go check that out. And, and last you guys love that one week, too. That one did numbers. So that yeah, one is the only very breakdown. responsive for the Joe Alt film breakdown. <laughs> That's really the only breakdown that did big numbers. And then uh, earlier this week, we talked about prospect visiting prospects visiting the Titans and Joe Alt was one of those guys. So we talked about him again there. So lots of content on this channel about Joe Alt. Go find it. We're moving on to the next guy on our list. Malik Neighbors, wide receiver LSU, comes in at number three on our big board for the Titans. Talk me through, Justin, the decision to include Neighbors behind Alt, but ahead of Fashionu. Well, I think for me, number one, he's a better overall player and prospect than Fashionu. Uh, number two, and, and this is the player I was alluding to, I bet there are Titans fans that have him ranked one or two. We've yeah. got him at three. For me... He's the wide receiver two in this class behind Marvin Harrison Jr. If I had him as wide receiver one, if I had him as a better player than Marvin Harrison Jr., he'd be number one on my mm. list because I would think that highly of him if I liked him better than Marvin Harrison Jr. I still really like the player, the prospect. Don't get me wrong. We did the film breakdown. You guys can go check that out on YouTube. Highlighted a ton of traits that we're fans of, the short area, quickness and explosiveness, ability in the open field, creates yards after catch. Very high on this player. Uh, I think you and I have both said it. Wouldn't be mad if he's the pick at number seven. Would only be maybe a little confused about what they're doing to protect the quarterback. Right, and that's how I feel. And um, really quickly, I will explain just a little more why we have Alt over Neighbors here. And I think that there's a chance the Titans have Neighbors over Alt. There's a chance people will like Neighbors more and he might be a better player. If I was building this big board just on what I wanted based on my own scouting reports, I might have Neighbors ahead. But looking at everything that the Titans have done in free agency, obviously signing a huge contract for Calvin Ridley and it completely so far ignoring the tackle position, despite having the worst left tackle combo with the guys they ran through last year in the entire league. Rand Carthon constantly talking about how we've added weapons around Will Levis and we hope we give him a chance to succeed, but we still got to protect him. Talking about how they've looked at the draft and the tackle depth in the draft, which you could take one of two ways. That could mean that there's depth and they can wait and not pick a tackle at seven, or it can mean like we're going to the draft to get our, to finish this offensive rebuild and get our left tackle. So everything that they've said and everything that they've done leads me to believe that they are going to pick a tackle very high in this draft. And that, again, that could be at 38. That could be contingent upon Joe Alt making it to pick number seven. But I think as much as I love Malik neighbors, I just don't think the Titans will take him ahead of Joe Alt because Yes, you're building, you know, you're trying to assemble a team of the best football players and you're not necessarily attacking needs in the draft, but the Titans have such a big need at left tackle and they are set with two great receivers that I, and it's a deep receiver class that can get someone later if they really want another one. I just don't feel good about, like you said, going into the, uh, into this season, who's going to protect Will Lois? And yeah, maybe they find the guy on day two. Maybe they sign Andres Pete, whatever. But do you want to feel okay about that? Or do you want to feel freaking great about that? And I want to feel great about it. So that's why Joe Alt comes in ahead. No brainer. As much as they love Will Levis, as much as they say they love Will Levis, yeah, you can show him love by uh, getting him a bunch of receivers, but you also got to show him some love by keeping him from being on his backside every single snap, right? And protecting exactly. him. And he had a couple injuries at the end of last year and you couldn't protect them. So it's like, I, I, I just, I, I wouldn't understand the offseason plan whatsoever 
uh, if they're passing on tackle at seven or if they're trading back and getting a tackle, I can still get that. But if you're just picking at seven and not picking a tackle, uh, I, I don't know. I would almost call it, you'd call it, you know, they might call it confidence. I would call it borderline arrogance to think that they could protect this quarterback without taking a tackle at seven or again, trading back and taking one. But if their first round, if the first round ends without them taking a tackle, uh, I, I think it's borderline arrogance that they think they can protect them without doing it. That said, the number four player on our big board is not a tackle. <laughs> We're looking at these two receivers here behind Marvin Harrison Jr. Malik Neighbors and Rome Odunze, the wide receiver out of Washington, comes in at number four. Very close as prospects. Most scouts have them, you know, within a couple of spots on a big board with, of each other. I tend to kind of like Rome Odunze maybe a little bit more than I like Malik Neighbors. And we're very high on Malik Neighbors, but I'm also very high on Rome Odunze. His advanced numbers against like man coverage are outstanding. His ball skills, his ability to win contested catches are absolutely elite. He can win down the field, can win in the short area. He is more prototypical X mold receiver than Malik Neighbors, who might be more of like a Z guy and can who can play in the slot. Whereas Rome, I think, is going to be like your single aligned wide receiver wide to the strong side of the field like he's going to be your your big dominant x player that i think can fill a big role for the titans deandre hopkins has been that kind of guy his whole career he's not as much anymore played you know i think the most snaps of his career last year out of the slot that he's ever played so he's a guy that's moving around a little bit more calvin ridley we know you know when the titans signed him a big knock was how he was used in Jacksonville, being that X who did not go in motion much, did not move around the formation much. Very different from how the Titans will probably use him. Jamar Chase was a guy that was moved all over the formation, and we've already talked. We've already heard Bill. Cal sorry, we've already heard Brian Callahan talk about how he sees Ridley in that Jamar Chase role for the Titans. So who's going to be the X? Is it going to be Hopkins? It can be, but I think at this point in his career, he's best suited when he can also move around the formation which is where I lead to Roma Dunze as a great fit next to these two receivers and for the future when only Calvin Ridley is left and he can play on the outside next to Calvin Ridley. So huge fan of Roma Dunze. He comes in at number four on our board. I think the distinction between neighbors and Odunze is very slight for me. So that's why we have them stacked back to back there. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, uh, you said everything I wanted to say, so I'll keep it short big bodied vertical explosive playmaker. We know Brian Callahan likes those types in his offense. He's neck and neck with Malik neighbors for me as the wide receiver too, in this class. I think there's enough separation between him and our next player, regardless of position that we felt the right thing to do was have him at number four here. Yeah, I agree. And, and to me, it's almost like Calvin Ridley and Romo Dunze, very similar to Jamar Chase, T Higgins, and you know, Brian Callahan has had success with that setup. So that's why I come back to that too. All right. The fifth player on our board, Justin Penn State tackle Ola Fashionu. Well, I almost switched this with number six and we're going to get to six in a second here, but uh, I think this is the last player I would consider at number seven. If you're sticking at number seven, I don't know that they'll feel the same way. You've seen a lot of mock drafts nowadays and not that that means anything, but you've seen a lot of them have this guy consistently sliding to like 14, 15 overall. So you wonder if some of that, they know stuff. I mean, guys that are plugged in are mocking him at 14, 15. So he's, you wonder what's there. Uh, some head of over these to Twitter, mocks, check out our film breakdown. Yeah, some of these mocks, he's sliding to the 20s. Sorry, I just wanted to point that out. No, like, yeah, I mean, that exactly, right? So it's interesting. You'd have to think there's some smoke where there's fire there. You and I both like the player enough where we'd at least consider him at number seven. I think he's like the last player we'd consider at seven, right? After all the others that we've already run through. So not likely, you know, more than, you know, they're going to have a chance, you'd think, at a Joe Alta, Malik Neighbors, or Roma Dunze at seven. And if they do, that's probably the player we would take or we'd entertain a trade down and, and getting a tackle. So we'll see what happens there. But uh, uh, certainly a guy that I'm high enough to at least consider there but you do have some pause based on everything you've heard. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, like you said, he's probably the last guy they'd pick at seven. Let's play out this scenario. Only three quarterbacks go in the top four, top six, I guess. Three quarterbacks go top six. Number four is Marvin Harrison Jr. Number five, Joe Alt. Number six, Malik Neighbors. Like the chances that Ola Fashionu is on the board at pick seven and is the highest guy on their board. Now, our version of their board, he wouldn't be the highest guy because we have Roma Dunze ahead of him. So right. 
there in order for him to be the highest guy on the board, if they have the same board as us, you'd only have two quarterbacks go in the top six. The other quarterbacks would have to slide. You'd have to get Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze, Malik Neighbors, and Joe Alt off the board along with two quarterbacks. That's the six picks, right? So I think that you're right. Maybe they have him ahead of Roma Dunze on their board. It's definitely possible that they do and that they get in the situation where they're like, well, we'd really love to trade back here, but nobody's biting. We're not getting enough value, so we're just going to have to stick and pick. And in that scenario, if somehow they have Fashionu over Roma Dunze, which again, is, it's very possible that they do, then they could take Ola Fashionu there at seven. But I think he is more likely in play in a trade back scenario than he is at pick number seven. I agree. I ultimately agree with that. Uh, I think that where there's, again, where there's smoke, there's fire and uh, seems like it's a, potentially more of a trade back candidate, which is why I almost swapped him with number six. And number six on our big board is not a player, although this is kind of a silly cop out by us. But anyway, number six. Option. I don't think it's a cop out because I think we're ranking options. We're ranking options. Okay. We're building a big board that has options. So the number six option on our big board here is to trade back. And I think the they will trade back. There's no way everyone we just talked about is already off the board. Like I said, I mean, right. we have five players ranked. Plus, you're expecting at least two quarterbacks to go. That's seven picks right there. So only six picks ahead of the Titans. They'd have to be in a situation where they just are getting a really good offer and they believe Ola Fashionu or Roma Dunze will still be there when wherever they're sliding back to, whether that's 11 with the Vikings, 12 with the Broncos, 13 with the Raiders, or potentially even farther back. And I think that they would hope that they can still get Fashionu or Rome wherever they slide back to. And if they can't, then the rest of the board that we're about to go through comes into play. Right. And again, I, I want to state that really clearly, we have this at number six. The reason we have it is uh, this might rank number one for the Titans. This might rank number two or three. I, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, even someone that really wants Joe Alter Malik Neighbors, for example, uh, if they felt the same way, this might be option number three. They would probably have this ahead of Olu Fashionu or Roma Dunze at seven. I think potentially is what I mean by how high the trade back option probably is. They got, look, it's straightforward. They got a ton of holes on this roster and they don't have a third round pick. They need more draft capital. So that's why we wanted to rank this in the top 10. Again, we're ranking it at six. I bet it's a lot higher than option number six on the Titans big board. I, I actually would guess if I had to totally guess, realistically, I think they probably have Marvin Harrison Jr., whatever, as like a pray to God he's there, but he probably yeah. won't be. Joe Alt, trade back. I think that's probably what their board looks like. Very possible. And, you know, the rest of these guys we're talking about would be awesome players, but I think that there is more value to be had in stacking picks. And just from a philosophical standpoint, ignore the specificity of this draft from an overall philosophy for drafting. Believing that you are going to be right about a certain player over the idea that adding more swings... Yep. More picks and more chances to be right about a player is just an arrogance that gets people fired, to be completely frank. That, like, the Cowboys wanted to draft Paxton Lynch. He got taken ahead of them. So they fell back onto Dak Prescott. Now, if the Cowboys were great evaluators, they would have had Dak Prescott as a first round pick, right? This guy went in the fourth round. Happens every year. Every year, Puka Nakua goes in the fifth round. Like, people drafted, yep. overdrafted so many players. John Robinson was like, I am confident that Des Fitzpatrick is going to be a good NFL wide receiver, confident enough to trade up for him. I will forego other picks. Amon Ross St. Brown, who? I don't care. I think this guy's a good player. That kind of drafting gets you fired eventually because the, the history just tells us it's impossible to predict as high of a grade as we can have on these receivers, on these tackles. It's impossible to predict who's actually going to be successful. So trading down and taking more swings is always going to be philo philosophically a better route. Now, there are instances where you can be very, very sure of a player and maybe, you know, you're right one year and wrong the next year or whatever, you know, specific draft classes may have more guys that you feel good about. But overall, you're always going to be better off trading down, getting more picks because a guy can be a blue chip prospect and not be good in the league or he can have off field issues or any, he can get hurt as for like anything can happen. You never know how it's going to play out. So I well, agree. I think trade down is probably higher on their board. 
we're really bad. Everyone is really bad at predicting the order these players should go in, not what order they will go in, the order they should go in. I mean, can you imagine if I dropped the big board in 2020, whatever year it was, and had like Justin Jefferson as my number one ranked player on the board? Like people would have thought I was insane. Even if I had him top five, three, four, second, third, fourth overall, Jalen Rager got drafted ahead of him, right? So it's right. like, we're really bad at it. You're right. More swings. It, it's not an exact science. You start to get yourself in trouble when you really think it is. So more swings always make sense. All right. The number seven player on our big board, I will tell you in one moment. First, we're going to give a shout out to our sponsors. Again, remember Sinkers Beverages in East Nashville and Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville sponsoring this episode. Look, like I said last time, these companies are huge supporters of the local Nashville and Titans community. They have a ginormous selection of booze, liquor, wine, beer, bourbon, whatever you want. They have it in terms of drinking for if you're stocking up for a party, maybe you got a draft party coming up, maybe you got a birthday party you want to celebrate, bachelor party in Nashville, bachelorette party, hello, huge in Nashville. Get all of your, your booze and your liquor for that party at Sinkers Beverages or Bluegrass Beverages. They're even on Uber Eats. All you got to do is, is load up your Uber Eats app and type in Sinkers Beverages, and you can have all the booze you want delivered straight to your door. So check them out, sinkersbeverages.com. Scroll down a little bit and find the link to join the in-crowd. In-crowd in members get access to allocated wines and spirits, exclusive events, early access to barrel releases, and more. And there's a link to find the in-crowd sign-up page in the description of this episode. So check it out. All right, Justin, moving on. Number seven on our board here, the sixth player, the seventh option, Alabama offensive tackle J.C. Latham. Now, this is under the trade-back option of our big board, so presumably the only scenario you would draft him is after trading back from pick seven. That's correct. That's why we included it this way. Like The Titans are hosting him on a pre-draft 30 visit, plug-and-play right tackle, outstanding grip strength in his hands, raw sheer power. He's a people mover in the run game. Uh, we did an outstanding film breakdown on YouTube on him. So go ahead and check it out. It's It's been doing pretty good numbers. You guys are showing interest in that. So, and Titans have shown interest in him again on a 30 visit. Teron Davenport said on like the Jared Stillman show that they really, really liked him. Uh, good football player. Again, watch the film breakdown. We talked about him for like 35, 40 minutes. Yeah. And you can find that on the YouTube channel. So go check that out now. Moving on to the eighth player. This is the one that will piss people off. Look, we did our our um, we did our mock draft multiverse scenario where we talked about this. We did our full dueling seven round mock drafts where I picked this player in the first round and we got some YouTube comments that were like, wow, you guys are stupid. Like <laughs> people really hate this direction that the Titans could go, but it's it's a it's a realistic direction. Ramon Foster has been like hammering this point on their radio show that this is where the Titans need to go with the seventh overall pick. Dallas Turner, another Bama player, this time a defensive end, opposite, basically the exact opposite of J.C. Latham, if that if that works. Um, but yeah, Dallas Turner edge is who we have number eight here. Well, he's the only defensive player on this entire list. Spoiler alert for the last two options, but uh, it makes a lot of sense. Look, I think I, I wrote it in an article and I'm going to say it on here. Uh, every single year for like the last 25 years or more, uh, edge, tackle, quarterback are the only three positions that have gone number one overall in the draft. It's a premium position. I'm beating a dead horse. You've probably heard me say it. They've got a huge hole opposite Harold Landry at that spot. Not re-signing Dina Coatry. Brian Callahan told you himself that Arden Key is a rotational pass rusher. That's the exact word he used. It's a huge hole. In fact, you shouldn't be mad at us because we're including him so far down this list. I think there's almost zero chance they get this guy if they don't take him at seven. Like I look yeah, at the Atlanta they trade Falcons back, at eight. He's... Yeah, if they trade back, he's likely off the board by the time wherever they're picking. Exactly. Is. Atlanta Falcons at eight with a defensive-minded head coach, Raheem Morris. They've been looking for a really good pass rusher for a couple years. Chicago Bears at number nine. I think there's a chance they go with a pass rusher like Dallas Turner. They finished 31 in sacks last year in the league. They traded for Montez Sweat midseason, so that helps. But I think still looking for a, a pass rusher opposite him. So I think he's going to be the first pass rusher off the board. Again, spoiler alert, Titans trade down to 11, 12, 13, 14. How often is the first pass rusher off the board going at 14 overall, right? It just doesn't happen in a league that craves pass rushers. Uh, we have him here because, again, we we under, you know, we respect more the need for a tackle or a receiver potentially on, with Callahan coaching this team. I don't think they're going to go pass rusher at 7, uh, but Dallas Turner is the best one in the class. You'd be crazy to at least not have him on a list of 10 potential options for the Titans. Bear, again, 
positional need value of position premium position that it is uh titans have at least to consider him yeah i agree and maybe we should have like thought more about the whole trade back scenario when we put this together and gone with like a jared verse or a Laitu latu for this pick no because he's still the number one pass rusher and if he's on your board you know you're hoping to get him if you're taking a pass rusher you might hope to get him through a trade back and not get him and if that happens You've got to be prepared for alternative scenarios, but there's no way, uh, you know, we got Marvin Harrison Jr. Number one. I think that's less likely than, than getting Dallas Turner at 10 or 11, for example, depending on how far they trade back. So if we were going to have to have one pass rusher on this list, it's got to be the best ranked one. Yeah, that's fair. All right. So moving on to the number nine option, the eighth player we're going to talk about here, another offensive tackle, Talies Fuaga. Am I saying it right? <laughs> I think you are out of Oregon State. I take tremendous pride because I was super early on this kid. I think I was talking about him. I think we did an episode back in October, November, where we were talking about who are some tackles in the draft, you asked me, when we were laughing at another Andre Dillard performance or whatever it was. (laughs) And I said, there's a kid at Oregon State you got to keep your eyes peeled for. I got on him really early. The tape blew me away initially. I mean, the plug-and-play right tackle, some similarities to J.C. Latham where the the sheer and the raw power to dominate his opposing blockers is outstanding. The one question here is the length, right? I think he clocked in just a hair under 32-inch arms, prompted some chatter about him kicking the guard. I don't think the arm length is prohibitive enough where I'm not putting him at right tackle. That's where I'm putting him. Again, you trade back. We talked about J.C. Latham. I've got him ranked slightly ahead of this kid. The arm length helps a lot um, to make that uh, determination, but If you trade back and you're looking for a tackle, he's got to be high on your list. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, that this is definitely a theme when it comes to the trade back scenarios here is, as we've said multiple times, it's either offensive tackle, one of the top three wide receivers, or maybe Dallas Turner. So spoiler for the next pick slash picks here, because this is a top 10 big board and one of our top 10 options was not a player we've decided to include two players here for the number 10 spot so number nine and ten players aka the 10th option here we combined sort of a marius mims offensive tackle out of georgia and tyler guyton offensive tackle out of oklahoma pretty similar players you know inexperienced not as many start a mims even less experienced than guyton insane athletes with very high upside for the position but have some you know development still left to do May not go until, you know, after pick 15-ish, maybe not till the 20s, I think, for both of these guys is is that range is in play here. Um, But two similar-ish prospects that both played right tackle in college probably could flip to the left side in the pros if they, if that's how the team saw their fit there. So uh, that's who we have here at number 10 is a combination of Amarius Mims and Tyler Guyton. Well, both of them played right tackle, like you said, but I view them so differently than J.C. Latham and Talis Fuago, who I think because of how how big they are and how they're run blockers first and these mammoth blockers, they're right tackles. I think these guys are super, super athletic and can kick over to the left side. In fact, I, I, I... almost expect them to like I think there's a very good chance that whoever drafts these two players will try them at left tackle especially if that's where they have a need um athletic yeah. freak super high performance ceiling a bit raw in the technical areas you got a great o-line coach like Bill Callahan uh, if the Titans end up with one of these guys it's through a trade down they're hosting Guyton on a top 30 visit if you watched our last podcast or listened to the last one that came out a couple days ago uh that's obviously some interest in him in fact I think they're purposely uh sort of targeting or, or a meeting with tackle that would be potential targets through trade back options. And both of these guys would be really, really good fits for that sort of scenario. Absolutely agree. So that does it. That rounds out our top 10 big board for the Tennessee Titans. And that does it for the episode. Thanks to everyone for tuning in audio wise. Thanks even more to those of you watching on YouTube. Like I said at the top, give this video a like, hit that thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button to this channel and turn on alerts so you get a notification every time we drop a new video. Best way to help this channel grow is to comment anything on the video, comment multiple times. Here's what I'm asking of you guys. Give us your top 10 big board for the Titans all in separate comments. So 10 comments per per person. I mean, 
that's going to help us grow more than anything else you guys could do. So we appreciate the support and we appreciate the support from our sponsors as well. Sinkers Beverages in East Nashville, Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville. Check out the link in this description to join the Sinkers in crowd. All right, Justin, that'll do it. We'll be back soon with more draft prep preview coverage coming your way next week as we really get into the meat of this thing. I mean, we are two weeks away from the draft as of the release of this video, Justin. So can't believe we're that close. And I think we're going to have to get back into the mock draft game next week. What do you think? <laughs> I think that would be fun. Hopefully you won't take Dallas Turner so no one calls you an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I think I learned my lesson there. Uh, no more Dallas Turner for me in the first round, even though we will remind you again, it's possible. It's, everything's possible. You never know what this team's going to do, especially with a second year GM and a first year head coach. We don't have trends and tendencies to look at for these nope, guys. So uh, who knows what, what direction they're going to go. All right. Until we return, you all stay safe out there and tighten up. A Broadway Sports Media Production.